Now this is a dripping faucet. I put a pie plate in the sink here just so I could hear the sound of it a little bit better. But let's, let's get in a little bit here. It's actually coming dripping through my water filter. Seem, I seem to get better, better drips <laughs> than straight from the faucet. Anyhow, let's get in here and see those drips. This is the kind of thing that would drive you nuts if you weren't doing it on purpose. But, listen and see if you hear any pattern or any consistency to it. So I've got the flow rate such that it doesn't really appear to have much of a pattern to it. It's not real steady, like a slow drip, drip, drip once every second. And if I had it much faster than that, then it would be a steady stream and not drip. So I'm in this area where it seems to be a little bit chaotic. So what we're going to do now, I've got this little recorder. This is a Zoom H2. We're going to set him up to record for a while these sounds, and then we'll see if we can do some analysis on the sounds. So I'm going to set up the recorder right now and grab maybe 20-30 minutes worth of drips to give a good uh, sample set. As you can see, this is a pretty messy signal. But it's really just the high peaks that we're looking for to time. That's when the drops occur. The rest of it's more noise from the thing dripping on the pie pan. So anyhow, with the Schmidt Trigger 555, we should be able to ignore most of that noise down below the higher peaks. And we'll get some nice timing, uh, time intervals for the actual drops. Then we'll be able to see if there's any pattern to it. This video is simply to demonstrate a Schmidt trigger, inverting Schmidt trigger, with a simple 555. Over here, we're not even hooked to the Arduino. We're just using it right now as power supply. <laughs> and what I have is a potentiometer right here uh, across the supply, and the center tap is going to go to the input inputs of the uh, 555, 2 and 6. And I'm going to run that thing up and down so you can see where the trigger points are. About a third and two thirds is where we're going to find those. So I've got two traces of the oscilloscope here and also a multimeter so we can check. Now, this multimeter is hooked to the input and trace one of the scope, the upper one, is going to be the input and trace two is going to be the output. So I'm going to go ahead right now and vary this pot, just turn him a little bit, and on the scope, hopefully this will show up good. You can see if I go up at a certain point, trace two drops down. Let me drop down again. And I've got to go below that trip point. You can see him, there he goes. And on the, um, on the multimeter, you can see that's about one and a half volts, 1.57. So the output has gone high. Now we're going to bring this output again. See, he goes low, no problem. No change, I should say. It's not a problem. <laughs> I'm going higher again. And there. At some point it trips three and a quarter volts, 3.23 or so. So we've got our upper and lower trip points based on the varying input, which is simply the, the potential. We're going to drop him down once more. There we go. Tripped up high. And we're at 1.23 volts. Now, what's, what's going to happen next is we're going to remove the potentiometer and apply our actual signal because we're going to be using this Schmidt trigger to clean up that signal. So I've switched over to the output of the Schmidt trigger. As you can see, we've got a square wave of sorts there. It's not 50% duty cycle, but it's a pretty clean wave. 
hopefully we won't get very many false triggers. We'll see what we, what we end up with. Over here on the computer screen, I'm in the serial monitor mode. You can see we're collecting up some good data. I've got the signal reduced enough so we're not getting very many zeros in there, which I think is a false trigger. So they're all pretty good readings from 200 and something to 700 and something. This is the Arduino sketch for saving the um, time intervals between the drops to an SD card. So we make a few comments up here at the top. A sketch for, for timing the interrupts and saving them to uh, an SD card. The interrupt zero, again just a reminder to myself, interrupt zero is on pin two and the interrupt service routine is going to be called save time. <laughs> Maybe a little bit uh, hokey name, but uh, that's what we're doing. We're saving time, time intervals. And then we'll write them to the SD card and also we write them to the serial port just because we're keeping track of it. Then we include a couple of libraries the serial library, SPI, and the SD card library, SD.h. And we declare a constant integer chip select is 4, that's for the SD card, and then the uh, constant integer uh, interrupt pin is 2. And then we have a unsigned long number. I'm calling it previous milliseconds. Okay, then we get into the setup portion here. Pin mode for the interrupt pin is input. We're going to attach our interrupt zero called save time on a rising edge. Could be falling edge, but we chose rising edge for this one. Then we open serial communications at 9600. Serial dot begin at 9600. And we've got SD begin chip select, which is four and unsigned long previous milliseconds. Okay, then comes the loop, which you can see is, <laughs> there's not much there. It's just loop. So we're just setting there in the loop. And so we go from one interrupt to the next. That's what this is all about. And here comes the interrupt called save time. We create a file on the SD card that we can write to. So file, data file equals SD open, we're calling it datalog.txt, and it's a write file. And then we declare our time passed, unsigned long. And here's where we determine the time that has passed since the last interrupt. Uh, time passed is current milliseconds minus previous milliseconds. And we go ahead and we write that to the SD card. Data file dot print line, which is time passed. And then we go ahead and we close that data file, data file dot close. And then we go ahead and print that to the serial port too, just to see what's going on, just to watch it. And then it, the next thing is we update, or you could call it reset previous time is current milliseconds. So right now, that's the that's milliseconds right now. So time, some time is going to pass till we get the next interrupt. And that's what the number we're going to subtract from what is the current milliseconds uh, at the time of the next interrupt. So you can see, not a lot to it. We do have a nice clean signal coming in now with a, with a clean rising edge. So hopefully we won't have very much for false triggering and we'll be saving these time intervals and then we'll have a look at them um, in the XY plane, see if we spot any patterns. Here's a little basic routine for converting this one column vector, this list of uh, time intervals, into a three column comma separated uh, file that we can plot. We're gonna open on F which is my thumb drive, this file called one column text. And that's the data set that we captured. 
and we're going to open that up for input as number one. We're going to define comma uh, dollar sign as a comma. <laughs> That's a string that we want to include. We're going to input from one x. In other words, get the first x value. We're going to input from one y. Get the first y value. And now we're going to go th through a loop here. F I from 1 to 9,990. We're going to input from 1 Z. Let's get the first Z value. Then we open F, another file called 3Columns.csv for append. In other words, we're going to keep on appending to that thing uh, all, all, our, all our new lines. And then we print to number 2 x and then a comma y and then a comma and then z and then we go ahead and close number two now here's where the trick is x equals y y equals z so we're updating x and y for the next line and then we pick up our new z value as we go through the loop again so we say next x and we keep doing that until we reach 9,990. And then we say print conversion finish. That lets me know uh, that we're done converting the file. And we end up with a three-dimensional vector, three columns, comma separated, that we can plot in three dimensions. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Okay, now Here's the fun part. Let's have a look at this plot and see um, if we can detect any uh, pattern to it. Keeping in mind, each of these dots represents a time interval. I'm going to move this thing just a little bit. You can see right here, we have some columns, again, time intervals. Look at it from the top a little bit. I still see a clustering in time. These are milliseconds out to about 500 milliseconds in each case. Gonna look at it from different directions. That's probably the original one. And again, some layering of time intervals. Close to, to zero, close to like 120, close to 230, and a bunch of outliers scattered. <laughs> We're just kind of moving this thing around. But there's definitely a pattern here. We've got three different layers, it appears, of time intervals where the points are clustered. Wow. Again, this is just a dripping faucet with a crazy sound to it. But we're seeing some pattern. This is not random. This may be chaotic. Let's just put this thing into a, an a animation where we rotate it around the z-axis. We can get a look <laughs> from different vantage points of it. Okay, so these are 10,000 points, which, which represent 10,000 time intervals between drops. And we're seeing some kind of structure in this thing. H how do you get structure out of just like a random dripping faucet? That's a good question. <laughs>